Sarah, welcome to the podcast. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you. Happy Halloween season. Yes. Happy Halloween. It's the perfect time to read This Is Not a Horror Movie, which of (laughs) course is our Big Gay Fiction Book Club selection for October because Will and I just adored it so, so much. For those who maybe haven't picked it up yet, tell everybody what this book is about. Well, it's a love story with romance and comedy and a beach and a monster that I'm not talking about very much because that would be a spoiler. I think at its core, it's a love story and everything is kind of happening around the love story. So Emery and Connor are summertime vacation neighbors and Emery is younger and always pined after elder Connor and Again, I don't want to get too spoilery, but I will say that a relationship develops and there's a mystery they have to solve that threatens their lives and the beach and their families and everybody else, really. Um, I would say it's pretty much could be a global disaster if they don't stop it. (laughs) It could. (laughs) Spoiler, spoiler. But yes, you're right. (laughs) But also, I had so much fun doing the comedy. So this is a book that you know, readers are laughing out loud and then they're like screaming and then they're sighing and there's a lot of emotions I've tried to bring forth through the comedy, but also through the horror because I'm a huge like fan of Evil Dead or Army of Darkness. I love horror movies that are comedic. So I kind of tried to do that with this book, but also had the love story in there too. And it's really, it's a romance, but it's also really a rom-com. There are elements for sure sure, between Emery and Connor that are just so swoony rom commy at the same time. (laughs) I think that was kind of the fun of it was, you know, exploring that because I do love horror movies, but then When Harry Met Sally is like one of my favorite movies of all time, too. So it's like weaving those worlds together was so fun for me and playing with their dialogue and just the way they relate to each other and the mistake moments and then you know I just had so much fun being with those two boys it was really a bummer when I finished the manuscript I was like oh man I gotta say bye this sucks I was kind of disappointed when I had to end the book it's like wait I want more I want want more (laughs) because they're so good together yeah you take their shared history that they have from you know I think it's four years of vacationing (laughs) And all of the kind of feelings they've built over that time that then coalesces in this one summer where it's kind of make or break time because they're about to go into college. Mm-hmm. And you may or may not summer the same way anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did love doing the backstory because the book technically takes place in present tense. So you're like in the moment with Emery. He's the narrator. You're with him through everything. But then there are also moments where he revisits previous summers. And that was super fun too, to develop that. Okay. This is how they were when Emery was 14, maybe when they first meet. And then like, this is how he is at 15, 16, 17, you know, that was so fun to show their growing relationship and show them growing as people. And then now finally this last summer, they get to grow as people in a relationship. Yeah. It was so delightful. And I have to ask a lot of romances, you know, are dual POV. Uh But here, except for the epilogue, we're always with Emery. How did it come to pass that we didn't get Connor's side of things as you went along? Well, interestingly, of all the characters I've written, male, female, whatever, Emery is the closest one to how I actually am. I am very awkward and kind of I don't know, lacking in confidence a lot of the time and kind of nervous, but I love horror movies. I love the books. So every reference he's making, I didn't have to look anything up. That's just all the things that I know already. (laughs) But it was so easy. But, you know, I think that's part of why God, I love Connor. Like I love his character, but Emery was me at that age. And so I didn't want to take the focus off of him Maybe it's a selfish reason. I don't know. But I was almost like exercising my own demons about my self-worth, my confidence, my body image issues at that same age, at 18. 
And so I just put all my heart into him. And his sense of humor is literally just me. Like I'm writing this book, like, <laughs> this is so funny because it's just like jokes that I would tell. And my friends have all said that, like you wrote yourself as an 18 year old gay boy. And I was like, I did, but I also, <laughs> we have things in common because we both like men and um, we both like horror movies. So it wasn't that much of a stretch really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that where Emery came from for you because he's so fully formed there on the page and mm -hmm. just all of that mix of 18 year old kind of gangly still growing into yourself it just springs right there so it all kind of tied back to your 18 year old self probably more like Oh, I'm still like that now. So I can't like, <laughs> I can't time travel and be like, no, I'm all grown up now and I'm so cool and suave now. No, no, I'm still really awkward. And my confidence is always like, I'm one of those people that's like, oh my gosh, I said that thing and I shouldn't have said that thing. And now is that person going to hate me? Cause I said that thing. And like, I know we all do that, but I still do that. I'm still growing. I'm 39, but I'm still learning how to be a human, like learning how to people basically. <laughs> so, I mean, Emery is me at many stages in my life, I would say from, you know, 14 to now, there are aspects of him that I relate to heavily still and probably always will. So yeah, that's part of why I guess he's still fully formed is because I actually am a human that exists in real life and just trying to put myself a lot into this book made him, I think, more just very alive. I, I was very happy with how he turned out, <laughs> my little memory boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had the narration that you got for the audiobook, too. Just oh, yeah nailed so much of Emery every step of the way, too. I don't know that you could have asked for a better narrator. OK, so interestingly, the day the book came out, literally the day the book came out, my narrator emailed me and I, I was like first of all I'm like how did you read this already it came out like six hours ago but he messaged me and it's like hey so can I narrate this and I said I yes yeah, send me a sample and as soon as I heard a sample it was just like oh my god you're literally Emery like oh my we have to hang out in real life sometime and like every comedic delivery every joke every awkward moment it's like Blake just totally owned it and um made it he just understood Emery and I think a lot of the things with Blake also he went through a lot of the same things that Emery did also and so he in his email it was really cute because he said I related to both Emery and Connor at different points in my life so that was really fun for him to be able to put himself into it kind of like I did too. Almost like we're both exercising some old teenage demons, you know? It's interesting how you put that, yeah. <laughs> kind of writing all that stuff or performing all that stuff out into the world in that way. Yeah, Blake Lockhart is, his, is my narrator's name. I wanna give him full love and devotion and credit for his brilliance. And he's doing a lot of other gay romances right now. He's narrating like a lot. He's getting super popular, super fast. And so if you can look up Blake Lockhart, definitely check out all the other books he's done as well. We'll definitely link to those and, and we'll definitely check him out because we certainly good. became fans from this book. I know, he's so good. We need to give Connor, I guess, a little bit of equal time here too. We yes. know where Emery came from. <laughs> how, how did Connor manifest on the page? So I'm a huge Call Me By Your Name fan, the movie. And I might write fan fiction about Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer. Okay, I totally do. Like I, like, I write a lot of fan fiction <laughs> because the movie just meant a lot to me. The character of Elio in that, that's Timothy Chalamet's character, also spoke to me um, as a bisexual woman. You know, I know again, I don't want to like. Say I understand a bisexual man's perspective, but as a bisexual woman, I felt for Elio a lot in the movie. And then of course I fell in love with Timothy Chalamet because like, duh, I don't, I don't know how you don't fall in love with them. Right. So I like fell in love with him. I followed his career and 
So Emery, honestly, like physically Emery is based on Timothy Chalamet with his long hair when his hair is really long. Which and you can just, kind of even get in the book. Cover. I know. My my cover artist was like, is this good? I said, yes, perfect. Your cover artist completely <laughs> nailed that picture that Connor takes in the book. I know. Minus the red eyes, of course, that aren't at the sky at that moment. But still, the beach shot is so perfect. I know. That's, Natasha Snow is my cover artist, and I love using her. She's so talented. And she was super nervous about this because she'd never done horror before, like a horror cover. And she's like, I just don't know if I can do it. And of course, she sends me that. I was like, nailed it. That's done, I guess. So, <laughs> all right. But anyway, back to Connor. I think he grew out of the character of Oliver in Call Me By Your Name, just in that, you know, I, I wanted the look, obviously. I wanted that blonde jock look because it was such a contrast to Emery. So I like having that separation between the two of them. But also I wanted that kind of, alpha vibe but not too much like it's a little alpha like uh, connor is a little alpha and he has his moments where he's super alpha and th those were so much fun to write the super alpha moments with him because emory's not having it of course he's like no this no i'm sorry you're naked. we're not doing this so i think connor kind of came out of call me by your name writing fan fiction and then just picturing a blonde beach hunk and <laughs> <laughs> but also I wanted someone that, you know, had a lot of depth to him because Emery, like you said, is a full rounded character and I couldn't have Connor just be like a dumb surfer kid. I needed him to have, first of all, something very much in common with Emery in that, as you'll learn, this isn't like a spoiler, but Connor wants to make movies and he loves horror movies and his dream is to direct movies. That's what he wants to do, or maybe cinematography or something. But that dream has been thwarted for like two years now, I think, by his dad. And so to add that kind of depth, that that struggle, which is one of my favorite scenes, actually, is when Emery's younger, it's like in the past, and he breaks up a fight between Connor and these other huge guys. And Emery's like this tiny, like, nah, no, don't. Like, he's a child almost. He's breaking up this fight. And I love that Connor's response was, you know, he felt comfortable enough to cry in front of Emery after that because he was just so upset. So I, I, I like all those nuances of Connor. I found them to be very important. But I also, what was really important to me also is I, I didn't want any stigma around being gay. And so that was a really fun thing for me with Connor too because his dad is like this crazy man who's like Crocodile Dundee walking around with, you know, yelling at everyone random things but I wanted it to be clear that when Connor came out and I don't want to tell you the full story of how he came out to his dad because it's which fun is so awesome but yeah we won't spoil it here we not do talk about it in the book club episode but we won't spoil it here yeah exactly well, we're not here but I wanted it to be clear that both Connor's parents love him for who he is and both Emery's parents love him for who he is and I just didn't want that I didn't want to have to, to have the drama of like oh, you're gay and we're going to judge you. I didn't want, I just didn't want that to be part of the book. It was really mm -hmm. important for it not to be because it just, it would have just not, it wouldn't have fit the tone of the book. And there is a certain scene with a certain woman down the beach. I can't, it's like, I can't talk about it, but, but there, you know, I also didn't want it to make like, be like an anti-Christian thing either of like, you know, oh, well the Christians, you know, think we're going to hell kind of thing. And that's what Emery has been taught to believe because of his high school experience where he had kids saying they would pray the gay away mm -hmm. and he had to deal with that in high school so it was nice for me to be able to put a better spin on the christian population through a character a beloved character in this book so yeah i really yeah, I love how you handled that particular character but even how you used religion at the end too mm -hmm. and some religious people which is all we'll say about that yeah. <laughs> Read the book, folks, and you'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. We can't talk about that. You mentioned this a little bit before, too, but I like how you bring in how Emery views his body. That is a lot of where Emery's caught up and like, why does Connor like me? I don't look right. He doesn't perceive himself to, into what he grew into after his last growth spurt, mm -hmm. despite the fact that pretty much everybody tells him he's wrong. Yeah. And I kind of like that little peek into, I guess I'd call it a little bit of mental health even. Yes. Of, you know, self-perception that it worked its way into this rom-com horror story. 
Well, and yeah, that's always in every book I've written is mental illness and mental health, because that's what I've been dealing with since I was 14. And so like, I mean, when I was 14, I thought I was super ugly and I would write myself really mean notes about how you're so ugly. Everyone hates you. And that went on for like two years before someone thought maybe we should get her some help. (laughs) And I luckily did, but I have, you know, I continue to battle depression and anxiety and I always will. They're not like, it's not like a cold. You can't take an antibiotic to cure depression and, and anxiety. You just have to learn how to take the right medication if you go that route or find the right treatment or keep going every day despite having, you know, many bad days in a row. You have to learn how to deal with your own issues in your own way. So that's why every book I've ever written has some aspect of mental illness or mental health. Some of them are way, way heavier than other ones. This was more of a sprinkling. But as I knew this would be kind of the demographic on this book is huge. Like the age range is huge of the people that have read it. I've had teenagers reaching out to me and I've had like 60 year old moms like reaching out to me, but knowing that teenagers were going to read it, I felt it was important to include something that a lot of them, boys and girls can relate to. And that was, so that was important to me. I had a, a first reader, it's actually the book's dedicated to her, Isabel. Isabel is 15 and she was a first reader and she's, you know, dealt with her own demons already. And she said, when she was done, she said she'd never related to a character more than Emery. And that that just was like, oh oh my God, like that really, that hit hard and made me realize that this book isn't just a rom-com with a monster. To some people, it's very relatable and emotional. And I like that. I like all the levels, you know? Yeah, because it really is. I mean, you hit it there with that broad demographic. This could just as easily be a a, a true young adult book, except that both Connor and Emery are both just a little bit older and they're just just barely past 18, you know, but they still connect to that YA side of things quite a bit too, especially in how their romance grows. And really in the romance side too, it's really, I like how you showed the care in getting consent even. You see that dialogue happening between them on what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. Is this okay with you? And things like that, which is such a great story, really to present to any audience, but certainly to the younger readers. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I love that moment when they, this isn't spoiler either, but they, they do kiss. It's not a spoiler. It's a romance. They they kiss. It's a romance. They kiss. But (laughs) I do love that moment when Connor's like, you want to go upstairs? And Emery's like, no, no, it's way too soon for that. So I like that moment a lot. Yeah. I I think that's important, especially with this generation that's growing up to be like, no, it's too soon. Like, no, I can't do that yet. And even more that Connor's like, okay, we're not. Yeah. Yeah. No pressure. No, nothing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about some of the horror side of the story. Since we've (laughs) talked about romance a little bit. Yeah. You already mentioned that you didn't have to do research for this. (laughs) And there's certainly your bio that says you'd like to live in a Tim Burton film. (laughs) Yes, I would. (laughs) So, to start this kind of conversation, which Tim Burton movie or movies, if you're going to do a mashup, where do you want to be? Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. I want to literally be Jack Skellington. I was Jack Skellington for Halloween last year, so I'm a little obsessive about that. I actually listen to the soundtrack when I like get ready in the morning. So. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a nerd. I love it, though. But yeah, I would love to live in Nightmare Before Christmas because... You have my favorite holidays. You've got Halloween and Christmas, and you can visit and live in either place. And yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that is very cool. I kind of figured it might be that one just for the mashup. Kind I of, thought you of, might have of, kind of yeah. guessed that already. Yeah. You had all these references in your head to pick from. How did you really kind of come down to like where Emery would have his focus? Like, so much Stephen King and then the good movie references to use. I think because I love horror movies and I know them so well, and I know the template, I know the rules, I know all the things about making and writing horror. So the references, like I said, I didn't do research. I also didn't have to think of the references. It was just like, because it's like my normal <laughs> life. I make horror movie references every day, probably. 
luckily my brother knows all of them. So I can like communicate with him and not sound like a weirdo. So I have one person that's like, oh yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, that makes sense. So those references just kind of flowed. I mean, just, they just worked for me. Like, especially there's a scene where they go see the sheriff for the first time, Emery and Connor, and 30 Days of Night is one of the most horrifying movies I've ever seen in my life. And I probably will never watch it again. Like once was fine. Have you seen that one? Oh no. Just by you saying, you know, seen it once and that was enough. I'm pretty sure that's what I never need to see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, probably not. But there's a scene in the movie where they're trying to find, you know, the authorities and there's the creaking sounds and just dark. And so as soon as they went in that sheriff office and they hear a creak, I'm like, well, that's just like 30 days of night. It just, so it just kind of flowed because it's like my everyday life talking about horror movies at all times. <laughs> and that's really the cool thing that you've done. Cause you could tell, I mean, that, you know, everything, as we said, just like Emery does, because it's every archetype that I can ever remember, especially out of 80s horror movies, Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, which of course is a little later on, yes. but Friday the 13th about, you know, the adults who like, nothing's happening here. The sheriff, that very sheriff archetype that we've seen a zillion times in horror movies. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I love that scene on the back patio when Emery's talking to his father and he's like, you want me to be one of the dead kids at the end of a horror movie? Do you? <laughs> and his dad's like, all right, fine. Like, I know, you know, so it's true, though. The parents would never listen. If they just listen, their kids wouldn't be stabbed in their beds and having nightmares and Freddy Krueger coming to get them and stuff. So, right. It's all the parents fault. <laughs> Yeah, parents, listen to your kids when they talk about monsters. They're real. I love the 80s things that you built in here, too, which surprised <laughs> me a little bit, given that we're talking about a, a book that is essentially set now. Mm -hmm. The reference to Tom Selleck ad magnum PI. Mm -hmm. The references to Golden Girls as comfort TV. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, those are other examples of autobiographical, because my friend in college, my roommate in college, if we watched a scary movie, she would have to watch Golden Girls before we went to bed. So that's from directly from my own life. <laughs> I was impressed, especially with Magnum, that Emery and Connor would be like, yep, Tom Selleck, Magnum. <laughs> that the teenagers of the now would know Tom Selleck from then. <laughs> and that might be a part fantasy on my part, just because I get sad thinking about the pop culture we're losing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not totally blaming social media, but I am kind of blaming social media because like you said, when we were kids, there wasn't internet really. Like you didn't have a computer in your house. There were just what was on TV. You aren't DVRing anything. You just have to watch what's on TV at the time, which I'm sure kids say are like, what? There wasn't yeah. streaming? Like they have no clue what this was like. And so I, I think I brought that in to show how Connor and Emery are still really rounded culturally. Like they know references from more than the last five years, you know, like I needed to do that for myself. Cause even my beloved dear husband didn't know who like Jimmy Stewart was or Humphrey Bogart. And I was like, Oh my gosh. I know. So I had to like educate him on, and he didn't know the Beatles at all. And I was like, Oh my God, what's happening in my life right now. But those actors are being lost i feel like in the current generation i don't know if a lot of quote kids would know who either of those actors are now i don't know yeah, so i kind good... of brought that in to be like hopeful of like please look outside your own generation and learn <laughs> things from older people like i sound so <laughs> old when i say that but i'm like please learn from your elders please you know without getting spoilery if we can how did you come up with the villain for this story Oh God, I can't answer that non-spoilery. Oh, I can't do it. I can't think of it. This is like a puzzle. Like, how do you do this without saying anything? I will say that I made a villain who represents everything Emery is not. And that's where the villain kind of came from, I think. And that's important. Because I know, like, I know there's the idea of making the relatable villain and arguing that, like, Michael Corleone, we're always rooting for him and he's like murdering people, but he's, you know, we, we like him. I didn't want to do that. 
I just wanted a villain. <laughs> so I had a blast just making a villain that Emery would clash with. That's all I can say about that, I think. I, I think you kind of hit it on the head, although I hadn't thought about it that way before. There, there is nothing likable about this villain. They are just a villain. They don't need a backstory, although mm -hmm. you give a little bit of a backstory. Yeah. But they don't need that backstory. It just is. And now we have to get rid of the problem. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. How was it for you to really balance the romance beats and the horror beats? Because one of the things that I liked so much here is that for the most part, and maybe all the way through, like the horror didn't necessarily interrupt a romantic moment. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that as Connor and Emery are on their first date, it's not interrupted by, ooh, we've, this thing happened and now we're not able to complete the date. Yes. So they got to have their complete moments together and then deal with the horror, but yet it all wraps together in, in a nice well-paced package to kind of propel you along too. I think I got lucky a lot of the time, honestly, <laughs> like it's a really educated answer. I know, but it also, I wanted their love story to be in the forefront. I wanted the horror to be the backdrop of it. I really wanted to show them falling in love with each other. That was my main drive for writing the book. I wanted to tell a love story about these two boys who showed up in my head one day and were like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, shoot, now I have to write a book, I guess. So I did want that to be in the forefront. And the horror is always kind of creeping in along the edges, just like a lot of horror movies, camera angles kind of, you know, I visualize a lot when I write, I'll see the scene before I write it. And so part of that probably is my fixation on film. So with this, it's the same idea where, you know, you have the weird camera angle maybe panning over this way, but they're still safe over here until the camera keeps getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And then you get to the, you know, kind of the climax and you're like, oh, okay. So our relationship has a foundation, but now like, oh my God, we're really screwed if we don't figure something out. And so then the horror kind of takes, takes precedence, but then you still get like, ah, eventually. <laughs> So I mixed them both, yes, but I did want the love story most prevalent. And the horror was just a great addition and so much fun for me to get to explore and realize just how geeky I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you were sad to see the story come to an end. Any chance we get some sequel or two or three or ten with Emory oh, and Connor? Oh, God. You're so <laughs> bad. I've had people... Yes, I've had a lot of people ask. I will say it won't be soon because I do have another book coming out in the next couple months. Meanwhile, I'm working on editing another manuscript. So there are at least two books that I have to complete and will be released prior um, to me maybe returning to them in college. It's kind of a conflict for me too, though, because I don't want to write about New York City. No offense to New York City, but they're both going to college in New York City. And I don't feel comfortable and confident enough in my knowledge of the city to properly portray it. This book takes place in a real place called Longboat Key, Florida. And I've gone there every April for like 20 years for, you know, a couple weeks. I know everything about Longboat Key, just like Liz and Emery, you know, the, this brother, sister pair, it's like another home for them. And that's how it is for me too. So developing the world and the setting was super easy because I spend so much time there. And so the idea of following them to college in New York City doesn't really appeal to me. So it would have to be somehow them coming back to, so it might have to be like a year, you know, for them to come back to Longboat again and like revisit them there and see where their relationship is. You know, no spoilers, but they're not gonna break up, okay? Cause that would freaking break my heart. And I'm yeah. the boss of these characters. So they are freaking staying together forever and ever and ever. Yeah, I oh. figured they had their happy. Um, yes, they have their there's happy. A, there's an eventual marriage and a maybe kids and whatever of else course. comes down the line. Um, oh, yeah, they have to. I mean, Emery's Italian. He has to have some child somehow because <laughs> Italians are kind of crazy about, <laughs> about the next generation. The thing that I really liked about how you left it, and I don't think this is necessarily spoilery either, is that there's no kind of cliffhanger. It's mm -hmm. not like a horror movie where it's like, 
things are good and we swing and look over there or get this other POV where there's like, you know, maybe the monster looking at you from over here and we're really not done. Mm -hmm. Even if we're really not done, yeah. as all horror movies are never really done. You didn't make it an overt thing that's like, there's more here that we must visit someday. I appreciated that in case it is a one and done book, which it could be. Maybe not. It goes back to that idea of it's a love story first and foremost. Yeah. And I want that happily ever after. Um, that's what I'm always working towards. Like I've scared people before with like my really heavy books that are much, much more into mental illness and much sadder and dealing with tragedy. And I've had readers like, oh my gosh, I'm, is, is someone going to die? Like I can't handle it. And I'll be like, you've read everything I've ever written. I have never done anything but a happily ever after. I am comfortable telling everyone that I will never not have a happily ever after because then I have to emotionally live with what I've just done. And I want my happy ending, dang it. So yes, everything's fine. But there's also talk of me maybe adapting it into a screenplay. So that's a possibility too. <laughs> I could just imagine as I was reading it and digging it, like, you know, maybe Ryan Murphy gets a hold of this. And I know, I know. Works I, a little magic on it. <laughs> I know. And I, I've written a screenplay before. It's not very fun for me. I really like description it's just too concise i used to be in journalism and uh, i just can't do concise i just bleh, I don't know, it's not my thing so <laughs> screenplays aren't my favorite to write but i have written one so i would like to adapt this one eventually i did send a copy of the book to timothy chalamet just in case nice you know just in case he was bored and wanted to make a movie with me or something Let's talk about your origin, because this is obviously not your first book. You've been publishing for a while. Mm -hmm. What got you started in writing? You mentioned journalism, and obviously at some point you've been writing fiction alongside when you were doing journalism. Yeah, I wrote my first novel quote in like eighth grade. I, I read so much as a kid. I was always reading a book. I was such a little nerd. I had those huge glasses that were like Coke bottles. That like made my eyes magnified. Like that was me. I had an eye patch at one point because I had a cross eye. That was me as a kid. Yeah, super cool. Not at all. So I would read books. And, you know, as we've mentioned, I was reading like Stephen King and Anne Rice in sixth grade already. So by the time I was in eighth grade, I thought, oh, I can do this. I'm going to write a book too. And it was a full length book. Like I look back and it's like 75,000 words. Like it's wow. actually a full novel. And then I just kind of continued doing that. I went to Ohio University for college. I started in journalism, realized I hated it and went to creative writing. Then I was still in journalism after graduation. I got the opportunity to be a sex columnist, which was like the most amazing job ever. So much fun and a travel columnist occasional. I got to travel sometimes, but then finally in 2016, 2015, um, a publisher picked up my first book called Bite Somebody. It's not my first book that I've ever written. Obviously, it's the first book that was good enough to be seen in public. And that came out in 2016. And that's actually a vampire romance that also takes place in Longboat Key, Florida. So I guess I've come full circle with this is not a horror movie. My first book and my last one I released both take place down there. And I've just been publishing ever since. And uh, it's a lot of work sometimes. I'm not going to lie. Like the best part of being a writer is writing. And then everything else is not that fun. <laughs> like, I wish there was a world where I could just sit in my room, like write my stories and they immediately go out and make me money. But that's not <laughs> how it works. Sadly, I do write. I still write pretty much every day. I still read a ton. I started mentoring younger writers and I've been to conferences and talked about social media. I've done all the things, but the favorite thing at the end of the day is always going to be sitting here at this desk and just being by myself and talking to invisible fictional characters. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't looked up before to see if Longboat Key happened to be real. Mm, so yes. it's kind of cool that it is, but also in the same way that Stephen King has scared me off of ever going to Maine. Now that you've put two books in Longboat Key, I'm pretty sure I'm never going there either. <laughs> you know, ironically, Stephen King has a house down there. Oh, that's hilarious. I know. It's, I mean, not always... just in Florida, but in Longboat Key. 
Yes. And we always joke that we're going to go find it. Me and my aunt were like, let's go find Stephen King. And she'll be like, I saw him today. I'm like, no, you didn't. And that's like our running. <laughs> we have to find Stephen King someday. I don't know if he still has it or if he sold it, but yeah, that was a weird coincidence. So has romance always been part of what you want to write? It sounds like horror and those elements also have kind of always been there. They always kind of combined in some way mm -hmm. for you. No, not necessarily. I mean, romance has always been my fixation. That was in that first book I wrote in eighth grade was a romance, but it was also like a civil war thriller, which, which I don't know how I thought of that when I was like 14 wow. years old. Yeah, I have no idea. So romance has always been very interesting to me. I don't know if I can like pinpoint why, maybe because as my Emory self, when I was that awkward, kid, like just nerdy kid, I just wanted someone to love me and like at the time no one was because I mean my parents my family was but I mean romantically you know I just wanted I wanted someone to come and think I was special and so I channeled that into my early writing and even when I was like a quote adult I'm still not a real adult I don't think but legally I was an adult I was still you know I still wanted the same thing I was still searching for love and so i found it now thank god but um that's always been a very important part of me i guess and so i love telling stories where characters find love also and then it sounds like also as we were talking about before blending in elements of mental health into those stories too sometimes quite heavy stories yes is also kind of one of your trademarks along the way mm-hmm yeah, always. I mean, ever since Bite Somebody, there's always mental health. And my book, oh, there's, We Still Live is one of my earlier novels. And that's about a college shooting. It's a gay romance as well, but it's very much an adult. This is an, an adult, adult book. But with that, it was another form of exorcism because the romantic interest, John, had depression and severe anxiety and um, PTSD. For me to be able to write him allowed me to put those parts of myself into a character. And as he started healing, I felt like I was healing with him. Maybe that's part of why I, I like to include the mental health because I have experienced it for so long. I just think it's something we need to talk about a lot more than we do. I'm glad that celebrities are starting to admit that they, like, especially with Simone, the gymnast. Yeah, Simone Biles. Yeah, like, that was very groundbreaking to me as someone who's been part of the mental illness community and, like, spoken about it at colleges and mentored teens about cutting and suicide. That was very important because it was showing that even these amazingly talented, tough people just need to step back sometimes and admit that they need help. I was very sad for her, obviously, but she was very groundbreaking in her honesty. And mm -hmm. so I hope we can do more of that as time goes on. And it's important to work that into books so people see themselves. Yeah, I hope so. And know that they can also come out on the other side as a romantic hero and have their happy, too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love it. Yes. Who are some of the authors that inspire stories that you tell? And I suspect that the first one out is going to be Stephen King, if I had Anne <laughs> Rice, if I had to guess. <laughs> I don't read them that much anymore. I read Dr. Sleep, which is the Shining sequel, because I had to, because it's the Shining sequel, and I'm obsessed with that book and that film. And that was fantastic. But that was probably the first thing I'd read by Stephen King in a while, because as I've started writing more romance or as I've been like immersed in the romance novel culture, I read a lot of romance now, especially gay romance. So authors like Lucy Lennox or Lily Morton are two of my favorites, but there are so many. It's like, it's just ridiculous how many good writers there are. And I also am so proud of them because a lot of them are self-publishing and just doing amazing work. And it's so cool to see that all these creatives are just like coming out of the woodwork and, and that gay romance has become such a huge market is wonderful to see. I wrote my first bisexual character in Abstract Love, which came out, I don't know time anymore because of COVID. It came out like last year, but that was so fun for me because 
I'd always written either heterosexual or gay and never bisexual. And finally I got to like put like that part of myself into a book too. That was so fun. So I'm, I'm so happy that the LGBTQ community is so represented in romance right now. And that especially gay romance is like, <laughs> like it's a really, it's a really big market right now. And that's freaking awesome. I love that. For people who are going to try to maybe get a, a little bit of a horror movie primer out of this is not a horror movie, any particulars you would send them down the path of watching first? I don't know if I mentioned this one, but my favorite horror movie is a horror comedy called Trick or Treat. I love that. Like, so it takes place in Ohio, which is where I live, because everything bad happens in Ohio, apparently, or Maine, as you said. Maine. But that one's so atmospheric and it has all the different tropes and different monsters and they all connect. It's like this Pulp Fiction meets a horror movie comedy situation. And Sam, my favorite like evil little character is in Trick or Treat. People should do Trick or Treat. This time of year, I always go for atmospheric. But the king of all horror movies is The Shining. That is, to me, the most terrifying beautifully made well acted the score is exceptional like the shining is the gold standard for me but still i love evil dead i love army of darkness cabin in the woods all of these comedic horror films that are so over the top and it's just wonderful it's very relaxing it's a weird thing to say about horror movies but i find them relaxing if you want to go old school i mean i'm not a big Nightmare on Elm Street fan, but I love Friday the 13th because summer camps are just, they're just inherently creepy, bad ideas. Like put a bunch of kids in the woods and see what happens. And that's why I just finished the Fear Street trilogy. It's on Netflix right now. Yes, and so that good. Was so good because I grew up reading R.L. Stein also in the Goosebumps books and Fear Street. So that's a really great starter too, because it's kind of quote advanced because they, if you don't know the tropes, you're going to miss a lot of the like Easter eggs. I feel like, cause they use so many tropes in that trilogy that like, if you know horror, you, you recognize so many of the of different aspects that you've seen other places that they're recreating and reinventing and making really scary. And just, Oh yeah. That trilogy was so good though. So those are yeah. some. I could go on forever with this question, so I'll stop because that's a good starting point, I think. So you, you, as you mentioned, you're reading a lot. What are some books you've read recently that you would actually recommend to our listeners? Oh, boy. I've been kind of dark lately, so I don't, I don't know if these are good suggestions or not, but Only James is a um, gay romance author, and their books... It's called the Necessary Evils series, and there are two. They're very stalker-ish, serial killer falls in love with unsuspecting normal human, but they're really hot, and Anli is such a great writer, and gosh, I just devoured those. Those are like reading one sitting books. At the same time, I'm reading a book right now. This is a ridiculous title, but it's called Witches, Sluts, Feminists. And it's nonfiction. I know. Isn't that the craziest That's title? An amazing ever title. Heard? I know. I was like, well, I have to read this, but it's nonfiction and it's about female sexuality and how we've been kind of ruined by the patriarchy and, you know, taught that we aren't supposed to be sexual. We're supposed to be Donna Reed. And so that's been a really fun book to read also, but it is nonfiction. So it might not be the complete target, you know, for your audience, but it feels like an important book for now. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It definitely speaks to themes that I think we're all dealing with right now. You mentioned a couple things coming up next. You're editing a manuscript. You've got another book that's coming out soon. What can you tease us about those? Well, the next book that's being published, I'm with Carnation Books. They did my book, Handsome Death and my novella, A Lord to Love. So this is my third time working with Carnation Books. And the next book coming out with them, it'll probably come out in the next few months. And it is gay romance with faded mate werewolves that really don't want to be faded mates, but they don't really have a choice. <laughs> that one's kind of dark because we're dealing with a double homicide at the beginning of one of the lead character's parents. And so we're dealing with who killed 
you know, these parents and now these people are fated mates and they don't even know each other, but they're going to be together for the rest of their lives. Like what weird pressure would that feel like? And so that's next. So it's werewolves and yeah, I love the fated mate thing. I, that's one of the tropes I enjoy reading about. So the book I'm currently editing, the manuscript is a gay romance with witches in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm curious to see how it's going to go because I wrote this book during my dog's illness and death. And like I said before, I channel a lot of stuff into my work and I'm really scared of what I'm going to find because I haven't reread it yet. So I'm just rereading it for the first time. And I'm really nervous about, uh, yeah, how much of, that experience is going to be waiting for me in the coming pages. So but that won't come out until at least like probably next summer, I would think. Okay. Two things to look forward to there. Gay romance and witches. I'm very interested about that. <laughs> uh, I love witchy stuff. Yes. I haven't read many <laughs> books, period, that use witches or warlocks, that kind of thing as like, especially as the romantic hero. So that yeah, well, that, they're kind of anti-heroes, so. Okay, that's fine Anti- too. <laughs> anti-heroes are so much fun. But yeah, that, that's, that'll be a fun one too. How can everybody keep up with you online to find out as these books get ready to come out and any other of the fun things that you're doing? My website is saradobebauer.com. And on my website, you can find all my social media, my newsletter sign up. And a bunch of freebies that are so fun. There are a bunch of short stories I've written over the years, and I'm very proud of them. And yeah, if you get those freebies, then you're immediately signing up for the newsletter. But yeah, I would love it for everyone. Come visit me on social media. And oh, I also have a private group on Facebook called Sarah Dilby Bowers Sexy Circle. And that's really where the magic really happens because that's where I find my beta readers, my early reviewers. I announce everything there and nowhere else. They're in the know over in that group. If you want to come visit us there, we're pretty ridiculous together. We have a really good time. Fantastic. Well, it has been so awesome talking to you. As this episode drops, there's about two weeks for everybody to read. This is not a horror movie (laughs) before we start discussing it in the book club episode. So pick this up. It's ideal Halloween reading for sure. Thank you so much for being with us. This has been so much fun. Thanks for having me. It has been so much fun. 